What's up, y'all? <laughs> this is going to be my first video on here. I figured I'd jump right into it. I'm going to start y'all off with a real, a good one, crazy one. This is from uh, my time at SMU1, uh, Supermax Prison, uh, Arizona DLC. And uh, this is a good one, so uh, here we go. It was like early to mid-90s. I was in my uh, early 20s. Um, you know, I was pretty much uh, fresh out of uh, my uh, military. Um, I was in the Army Reserve, you know, so uh, I was about to put all that training to the test, you know. So, you know, I knew I had to get out of the hood because all my homies were getting hooked on crack and getting into all kinds of trouble. Um, they were getting into some other stuff too, you know, like uh, stealing cars, breaking into houses, you know, all that really bad stuff. So I decided to join the military, Army Reserves, like I said, to get me out of there for a while. Um, so when I got back from all the military training, I got a job where I felt like I could use that training, you know, put it to good use at the Arizona Department of Corrections. My mama wasn't happy, of course. She said, mijo, why you always got to do these dangerous jobs? <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't know, mom, it's just the way I am, I guess. So, uh, you know, I told her, I think it's something I would be good at. So, uh, I went through the uh, Arizona DOC Academy in uh, Tucson, Arizona, and I got some stories about the DOC Academy too. I met, I made some of my best friends later on in life there. Um, a couple of them dudes are kind of crazy too, you know, super intense, just hardcore crazy dudes like myself. But uh, anyway. Um, you know, uh, I got assigned to SMU1. You know, I guess they figured I'd fit the, you know, the type that would be good to work there. You know, I could handle it. It's a level five Supermax. I was excited because I knew that was where I was meant to be. So I thought, <laughs> um, with the worst of the worst, you know, because I felt like I was made for it, but you know what they say, be careful what you wish for. Um, so when I, when I arrived at SMU1, myself and all the other new officers got a briefing explaining what to expect. We were told to leave uh, our outside problems at the gate. You need to be focused at all times. A mistake in here can get you seriously injured or killed. We were told these are all violent offenders the worst in the state, the majority are hardcore prison gang members, and some of them are shot callers or bosses. We were briefed on all the different prison gangs. Um, the Emma, you know, Mexican Mafia was, uh, was the Chicano gang, uh, you know, Mexican American, pretty much ran stuff, you know. Aryan Brotherhood and Skinheads were next, you know, that was the white gangs. <clears throat> Excuse me. The black inmates slash convicts were very divided. You had, you know, the street gangs. They still um, have the street gangs inside the prison. So you had Crips, Bloods, and then you had another gang called the Mau Mau's, which was Rastafarians. You know, they all had dreadlocks. You didn't have to be Jamaican. You just had to follow that lifestyle. You know, so they all, they all had dreads. And, of course, you know, they love the sticky green, you know, um, but they were just as violent, if not more violent than the other gangs. Um, let's see. <clears throat> For the natives, you know, the um, uh, American Indians, uh, Native Americans, you had Warrior Society, um, which was mostly composed of Apaches. Um, they were like the strongest 
you know, nation and their, um, and uh, they were known to be extremely violent. They always carried knives. I mean, most of the prison gangs did, you know, when they needed to, but um, for the Mexican nationals or, uh, you know, quote unquote, illegal immigrants, you had the Border Brothers. That was their main gang. Uh, I think there might have been a, a, another one, too, but I don't remember the name of it. So anyway, things started out fairly well for me. Uh, you know, I, I got a cool head in most situations um, and lots of common sense in most situations. Um, that's what you really need inside there to keep you out of trouble most of the time. Um, I made a couple of rookie mistakes, but nothing too big. Most of the convicts gave me respect because they could tell I was military. They had respect for military dudes in there because, you know, you're physically fit. You got that discipline and your uniform always looks good. All that, all that stuff matters to them. They size you up as soon as you walk anywhere, especially when you walk in the pod where they live. They just all come to the front and stare you down, you know, and if you show fear, you're done, man. A lot of people didn't last there very long, you know. But anyway, um, like I said, they gave me respect because I was military. They could tell right off that I came from the hood just because the way I, I spoke and, the, you know, the way I carried myself. Um, you know, I didn't make any effort to let them know, you know, hey, this is where I'm from or anything like that. They just kind of figure things out on their own, you know. They ask you stuff, you know, and you got to try not to give them too much, you know, detailed information about yourself. You don't want them knowing too much about you. But uh, anyway, um, but the Chicanos, my own people, were the ones that sweated me the most, um, as would be with probably any other CO. The, if you're white, the whites are going to come at you. You know, if you're black, the blacks are going to come at you, you know, so on and so forth. Um, they would ask if I was down with the brown, you know, what they meant is like, are you down with the brown pride? You know, I would say, yeah, but I'm not an inmate or a gangster. I'm a CO. So I'm trying to represent my race in a positive way, you know, and of course they weren't trying to hear that. So they would talk smack, you know. And like, uh, <laughs> call me various things. Like they would say you're a coconut, you know, brown on the outside, white on the inside. <laughs> that cracked me up, you know, I'd be like, I'm going to use that, <laughs> you know. Um, they would, uh, let me see, what else did they say? Um, just stuff like, man, we ain't trying to hear that. Like, don't be coming in here preaching to us, you know, and this and that. <clears throat> so I'd be like, all right, cool, man. Um so to try to give you a mental image of this place, I will do my best. Um, from the outside, it kind of looked like a modern day castle of, you know, some type. It had two big fences full of crazy amounts of razor wire that was also electrified. You know, when I say it looked like a castle, it's because it was like, um, I guess cement or whatever, but it was like dark gray, just crazy. It looked like a freaking castle, like just like an intimidating looking place. You know, mostly everybody would say, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, crazy amounts of razor wire. They were also electrified. And uh, I think there was a total of uh, four towers. They were manned at all times by COs with AR-15s, a 12-gauge shotgun, and at the time when I started, it was a 38 caliber handgun, but later on they switched to a, a Glock. I think it was like a Glock 19 or something. Um, the building itself, like I said, was dark concrete and cement, just looked crazy, intimidating. Um, not even exaggerating, the minute you set foot in this place, um, 
you could feel the evil in it. Like, no joke, man. It was just hardcore, you know. Um, and I've heard other COs that worked there describe it the exact same way. And it just, like, gave me, a, like, chills, you know, like to hear another CO that I didn't even know when I worked there. Because it's a big place. You have, like, different sh three different shifts. And, you know, sometimes there's people, there's other people that work there. And you might have maybe heard of their name here or there, but it's a big turnover in a place like that. People come and go. So, like, you know, like I said, it was crazy to hear another person describe it the exact same way that I described it, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, every day before I entered, I would prepare myself mentally by raising an imaginary mental barrier around myself. Now, don't get me wrong, <laughs> this ain't going to protect, this wasn't going to protect you in any way from physical harm. This was just to protect against all the mental mind games and intimidation these guys played. Many of the new COs and even counselors, like I said before, did not last more than a few days or weeks. They would just quit and not come back, you know. Um... The turnover rate was crazy, like I said. So, of course, the place was very understaffed, and they were constantly... Hang on a minute. <laughs> well, I'll turn the page. They were, they were constant, constantly lowering the critical number of staff allowed to run it. Um, you know, I think when I first started there, the critical number was like, uh, I think maybe like 50-something, like maybe like 57 to run the whole place. And I don't remember the exact number, like for the population there, but um, I think it was maybe like, I think it was maybe like around 1200 or something like that because of the level of the offenders, like, you know, almost every inmate had their own cell, like they had to be housed separately. So you can't have like a really big population, you know, so, um, Anyway, so you got about 57 COs for about 1,200 level five killers. You know, most of them were killers. Um, but uh, that number kept dropping. I think when I finally got out of there, that number was like, I think it was like in the high 30s, like no joke um, for the COs, you know, like maybe 38, something like that. Anyway, um, like I said, you know, the whole place housed about 1,200 of the worst individuals in the state. From the inside, it was divided into two halves, two halves, West Wing and East Wing. Each side had four units, Abel, Baker on one side, Charlie and Dog units on the other side. Each unit had six pods, which mostly housed one individual to each cell, like I said, due to their level five classification when you first enter the unit there is a walkway shaped like a horseshoe and there are six doors which separate you from each pod surrounding the horseshoe um, there is a control tower up above which you can look through plexiglass and steel bars to see an officer up there um, you know controlling the doors there was one wing uh, wing three, it was called uh, Baker Charlie units that housed two inmates per cell. It was the only unit in the whole prison that had two inmates per cell. Um, these inmates were 5-4 classification. Um, so they were just slightly lower classification. The first number being their crime. The second number, their behavior while incarcerated. So 5-4 just means even though they're a level 5 inmate, they've somewhat behaved for, you know, a short amount of time. So they're like on a step program where they actually were allowed to come out to the day room in their pods for like a limited, limited amount of time each day. And they were actually allowed um, some time on the rec, the rec pen, like the big rec pen, not the... Um, I don't remember if I uh, explained this, but for these level five inmates, they have like a small 
rec pen at the end of the pod that's like for just individual for one individual kind of looks like just a small room um just like four walls and they just the only thing they have is like a handball they can go in there and throw the handball around or just work out that's all they do anyways is just work out all the time um but for wing three they actually got to go outside to an outdoor rec yard that had a um a basketball court and uh you know um but they took them in small numbers like no no more than like i think 11 or 12 at a time and you would have one you know unlucky co <laughs> on the rec yard with them and then you would have one co up in the tower you know and they would only put certain co's in that tower for the rec yard like co's that um you know the shift lieutenant was very confident would do what they needed to do like i'm talking about you need if something goes down you need to pull that trigger and keep that uh co alive on that rec yard or you need to protect another inmate from if one inmate has a knife and is stabbing the other inmate you need to shoot that inmate with the knife like no hesitations um you know that was the reality of it and I got to work that tower, you know, a few different times. You know, the shift lieutenant was, uh, you know, he had a lot of confidence in me that uh, I would do what I needed to do because of my military experience and because of uh, my background, you know, just growing up in a, you know, pretty, you know, hardcore situation. I mean, you know, projects, um, you know, it wasn't uh, Cabrini Green or uh, South Central Los Angeles or nothing, you know, but our projects was pretty rough too, you know, just smaller, smaller scale than those other places, you know, but still pretty much the same thing, you know, but anyway, um, like I said, um, you know, that was, uh, I think I was talking about classification. Um, so like I said before, the majority of these dudes were extremely violent offenders some of these were hitmen or enforcers for their various prison gangs. Most of these guys were tattooed from head to toe. I mean, their faces, heads, and necks, everything. And these guys did not speak to you at all. Um, you know, um, hey, you know, I'm no punk. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> I ain't never let nobody call me that to my face and just get away with it. But, um... These dudes, you do not, you do not want to mess with these dudes, man. Um, these dudes were scary as hell. I'm talking like straight killers, you know. And uh, but uh, the scariest ones of all were the shot callers. They were usually older, more calm and respectful, but they only spoke to you about official prison stuff, no small talk. Um, the thing that was scary about these guys is they can send some, they not only can they send somebody to hurt you while you're there at the prison, I mean, snap of a finger, you know, you disrespect one of them, do something stupid, they'll send somebody to get you. Um, they can send somebody to your house on the streets, you know, they had real power on the streets, not just in the prison. That's what made them scary, you know. So, like I started to say before, you know, things started out pretty good. My first major issue I had was with these Chicano inmates from a small town, um, you know, like near my hometown uh, in Arizona. Um, you know, I, I was going to say the name of the town, but, you know, I probably won't mention it. Don't want to piss him, anybody off from that town, you know. <laughs> I got some family and some, you know, some friends from that little town but uh, anyway this town is known for its uh yaki indian population and it's always had a lot of gang activity anyway um this individual or these individuals those two of them were housed in two baker charlie unit um it was uh, it was uh one of the more you know uh like units that acted up quite a bit a lot of younger inmates you know and a lot of them like with the younger inmates the thing that you had to watch out for as long as a lot of them are trying to prove themselves or like gain some rank you know some respect 
So um, for whatever reason, these two individuals, you know, pick, pick me from the start and uh, just, you know, um, they started talking trash to me every time I came in the pod. Um, you know, I think they were hating, you know, because I was just fresh out of the military. You know, I was a good looking dude, <laughs> you know, um, and hey, I had my freedom. So they hate that, you know. Um, even though they put themselves where they're at, you know, a lot of dudes want to play victim, like, you know, like, you know, they don't belong there or whatever. They're just, you know, angry about it, I guess. But anyway, um, so, you know, my reaction, you know, was, uh, I gave them back, you know, what they gave me, you know, I talked some stuff back to them. We just kind of go, go at it. We go at it back and forth or whatever, you know, but, um. You know, finally one day I got kind of fed up with them. So, um, you know, I uh, I called up some of my, you know, some of my CO homies on the radio and was like, you know, um, I need to do some shakedowns in Two Baker Charlie, you know, pod one. So, um, you know, the first five cell, five cell searches went, you know, pretty normal. Um, we found some illegal stuff, nothing too major, except we did find a small uh, homemade knife, you know, a shank. Um, then the last cell, you know, we I saved the last cell for the um, the main dude in there that was always talking crap, you know. Um, and, um, you know, so he was kind of a big dude, like maybe about 6'1". Uh, kind of lean. He was in decent shape. He wasn't like super swole or anything, but he was just a big young dude, you know, like about six one. Um, had a decent little build on him. Um, trying to remember his name. I mean, I'm not going to say it anyway, but um, if I remember it, I'll say the first letter of his last name. That's all I'm going to say. But anyway, um, you know, I don't know if he had any affiliation, you know, he, he definitely belonged to a, probably some street gang or something, but, you know, I don't think he was like, uh, he wasn't like patched up or anything as far as I know, like, you know, in a major prison gang, but he might've been like trying to make a name for himself, you know, like trying to, you know, I don't know, audition for a, uh, you know, for a promotion, you know? But anyway, um, okay, his, I just remembered his last name. It starts with an R, so, you know, I'll just call him R. Um, we cuffed him up. You know, he was talking mad stuff, you know. He was talking all kinds of stuff, mainly to me, but some to the other COs. So we cuffed him up and escorted him um, to the bottom shower. That's what, where we usually secured the inmates when we're searching their cell, we would escort them to the shower, lock, lock them in the shower. Of course, you know, first we would search the shower to make sure there was no weapons in there, no, uh, you know, like homemade ha handcuff keys, because a lot of them knew how to make their own handcuff keys, like out of paper clips or whatever little pieces of metal they could get a hold of. Um, you know, so um, we secured them in a the bottom shower while we searched his cell, he was yelling and talking all kinds of mess. Um, what we, you know, what we didn't, what we didn't know was he had made a homemade handcuff key and hidden it in his mouth. You know, that's where I'm, pre I'm pretty sure that's where he had it. Or maybe in, you know, another place that they like to hide stuff in. We used to call it the man purse, you know. <laughs> it's somewhere down below. <laughs> he can figure it out, you know. Um... But anyway, um, he uh, he had a homemade handcuff key somewhere. And uh, so we, when we completed his cell search, we started to escort him back to his cell. He first lunged at me and tried to headbutt me, but I blocked it with the forearm to his chest, you know, like put my forearm up and just knocked him up against the, the wall and held him there. Um, you know, he... Uh, he kind of twisted his, his head like this and he bit my hand, uh, bit my hand pretty hard. He drew blood actually. 
And, um, you know, so uh, he, but he did that as a distraction. Like, right when he did that, um, we noticed one of his, like, he had gotten one of his arms free, and he um, he basically um, took a swing at me with the, um, with the handcuffs still connected to his other wrist. So in one of my other videos, I'm going to talk about that because um, what these guys did this as an attack tactic. If they could get one cuff loose, they would wrap the loose handcuff around their fist. So like the say like this is the loose cuff, it would be around the front of the hand, you know, say because the other cuff is connected to the wrist. They kind of flip it like that, and they flip the open handcuff over their hand, and they'll use it as a like a brass knuckle. And trust me, you don't want to get hit by that because I'm gonna talk about it in one of my other videos. There was a CO that got a serious beat down like that by a, a handcuff, you know, used like brass knuckles to his face, and he was never the same. Like it, it was crazy. But anyway, um. He uh, he took a swing at me, you know. Luckily, um, at the time, man, I was I was in tip top shape. I was fresh out of, you know, basic training and AIT, um, you know, job training, and I was big time into martial arts, man. I was into kickboxing, boxing. Um, I had done some wrestling, like uh, just like in junior high, I wrestled for one year, um, but I was pretty good at it. Uh, I even uh, I did some jujitsu training at a, um, a place in, in my hometown. It was a, Gr a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy. Um, you know, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu representatives ran it, and so I had a lot of a um, lot of martial arts training. Just growing up fighting in the streets, you know, like that was I was always that was what I did. You know, like I just I got in a lot of fights. <laughs> you know. Um, but anyway, I you know my, I got quick reflexes. I uh, I basically ducked under his punch. I um, I used my wrestling slash jujitsu, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I I shot a double leg on him. I picked homie up and I slammed him on the back of his head like hard as I could. And uh, when he hit the ground, his eyes like rolled, you know, in the back of his head. Like he didn't go unconscious. I'll give him that. Dude was tough. Most dudes would have knocked out from that, you know, because I weighed about, I only weighed about, at the time, about 185. I was pretty slim, you know, and but I was pretty, you know, I was pretty jacked. I was, you know, I was pretty swole, but I only weighed like 185. And uh, anyway, I drove him to the ground. He almost went unconscious. His eyes just kind of like rolled, you know, but he's kept consciousness. But, um... Anyway, um, you know, um, let's see, where am I here? I mean, that saved, saved my butt, you know, it was my quick reflexes and, you know, all my, you know, martial arts and, and street fighting experience or whatever. Um, you know, uh, we secured him, you know, the other, other COs, you know, jumped on him, assisted me. We, we, we re-secured him. Um, you know, um, I didn't need any stitches, but I did need penicillin. My hand got pretty swelled up, uh, where he bit me. Um, it got a little bit infected, you know, cause the mouth, the human mouth is nasty. You don't want to, you don't want to get bit by another human. You're probably better off getting bit by a dog, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, uh, it was scary because I didn't know if he had a hep C or HIV or anything like that. A lot of the inmates have hep C or, you know, you know, the other hepatitis, you know, you know, various hepatitis because uh, of sharing drug needles and tattoo needles, you know, um, they share it like it's nothing in there. Um, but thank God he didn't. He was just plain old, you know, pain in the butt. Uh, Hardhead youngster, you know, he didn't have anything, so I dodged that bullet. Um, anyway, what, you know, what he didn't know was that they had just started giving more, um, giving more time for assaults against staff. Or, I mean, assaults against each other probably, too, but before 
you know, before that, it would have just been like 30 day, 30 to 90 days loss of privileges, um, you know, like no TV, because they had their own, um, their, their own little TVs in their cell. They were like these clear, like see-through TVs that they could purchase, um, you know, the ones that could afford it or they had family that would buy them one or whatever. But, you know, it would have been 30, 90 days loss of his TV privileges um, or, uh, you know, loss of commissary, you know, stuff like that. Or maybe tell, maybe no telephone time. But um, he ended up getting um, another two and a half to three years added on for aggravated assault. So, you know, now he really hated me. I don't know if he did before, but now he really did. Um but I was like, hey, you know, you did it to yourself, dude. I don't know what to tell you. But, um, <clears throat> you know, the crazy thing is, uh, uh, oh, I, f <laughs> I forgot to mention this. I was going to mention this at the beginning of the video, and I totally forgot. I got to give a shout out to my homie, Hood Horror. Um, he's another channel here on YouTube that's, you know, pretty well established already. He's got like over... Like, I think about 3,500 followers, you know? And um, I had actually sent him three of my stories. This was one of them, you know? And, um, you know, I just wanted to redo it and tell it in my own words. Um, but uh, I got to give a shout out to the homie Hood Horror, man. He's, he's the one that kind of, you know, told me like, hey man, you should do your own channels. You got really good stories and they're true. And he told me, like, hey, of all the stories, you know, people have sent me, I think your stories are the best ones of the true ones, you know, because he does, like, creepy pastas and stuff like that, you know. But he said of the true ones, you know, he liked mine the best. So he told me, you know, you have a good voice, you should do it. I wasn't too sure about it, you know. I was like, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, I don't really like to listen to the sound of my own voice, but I think maybe that's most people. I don't know. But um, he convinced me to do it, so... You know, I, I, I'm i throwing that shout out to the homie, Hood Horror, you know, right here, bro. But um, that's not the end of the story. Um, I actually forgot this to, I didn't add this part before when, when you know, when I, I sent the story to Hood Horror. I actually ended up running into homeboy in the streets. Uh, R, you know, the, the, the dude that uh, tried to assault me. It was like maybe I don't I don't remember like how many years it was after that happened. I don't think it was too long afterwards, but I was actually a bouncer at this bar in my in my hometown. It was a pretty pretty rough bar slash club, you know. And um, I mean, I'll, I'll say the name of the place because it's been like so long. It was it was called Bronco Billy's, and it started out as a country bar, as you can you know um, probably tell by the name. But it it eventually um, kind of changed into, uh, um, on Friday nights, they had, uh, I think it was, um, old school and hip hop and, you know, it was like a DJ. And then on Saturdays, like sometimes they would have a band and a DJ and it would be like, um, they would play like Mexican music and stuff. Um, and, um, anyway, like I was a bouncer there and, um, you know, I did that, um, part-time, you know, and uh, I think I wasn't I wasn't working at the prison anymore. I think I had I had quit and I was working at the high school doing campus security. Um, so I was working on the weekends at the bar bouncing. And, you know, I kind of made it a habit to um, to scan the crowd, you know, you know, and just look for familiar faces because I always knew like I would run into guys that just got out of the pen or whatever. And the majority of the time, it was a good experience because, like I, you know, said, I was always very respectful. I was professional. I just did my job. I didn't sweat them for dumb crap. The majority of them would always, like, when they seen me, like, if, if I saw them on the outside, they would always walk up to me and shake my hand. And I would shake their hand and tell them, you know, I hope you're doing good. I hope you stay out. And it was always the same thing, like, hey, man, you were one of the coolest COs in there. You didn't sweat the dumb stuff. You just did your job. You were always, you know, real respectful, you know. It was a, it was a positive experience 99.9% .9 of the time. The only negative experience I ever had, and it 
turned out positive in the end was with that dude, was with R. He walked into the bar one night and I seen him as soon as he walked in, I spotted him. He was with, you know, one of his homies. And uh, so I watched him, you know, um, you know, he kind of uh, just was like walking around, scoping the place out or whatever. And um, so I waited for him to look over my direction and I kind of went to him like this, you know, like, come here, you know? So he kind of like, you know, got kind of surprised and he said something to his, to his homie and they walked over to me and uh, I said, what's up, man? When'd you get out? And he goes, about two months ago. I said, so are you uh, staying out of trouble or are you effing up again so you can go right back? And he just kind of like, you know, kind of made a face and was like, Psst. he's like, Charlie Holmes, you know, <laughs> he was like straight up Cholo, you know? And uh, so uh, I said, hey, um, so I'm gonna tell you just like this. I said, you know, what happened in there happened in there, you know, we could leave it in the past. Um, we can squash whatever beef was between us. And you and your, your homie can stay here and have a good time. If not, if you want to keep the beef going or you want to continue to have beef with me, I said, you know, I kind of went like this to my shirt because it says security. I said, me and my homies, I pointed to some of the other security, you know, bouncers in there. I said, me and my homies will get you and your homie and toss you the F out, you know? And he was like, I don't know. I said, he goes, that was... That was some messed up, you know, S he pulled in there or, or did to me or whatever. I said, hey, man, that's a messed up situation altogether. And there I said, I did what I felt I needed to do when you you came at me, you know. If we would have been in the streets, we would have went toe to toe, you know, man to man. It would have just, you know, been heads up, you know. But like I said, that's a messed up situation in there. And we each got to use, you know, our own advantages, you know. So, uh, you know, I said, what's it going to be, you know? And he kind of thought about it. And he was like, all right, I said, he goes, we can squash it, you know? So we shook hands, you know, and uh, I said, all right, man. I said, have a good time, man. You know, let me know if, if you need anything, you know, drink or whatever. I'll, I'll hook you up with, you know, with one free drink, you know? He was like, all right. He's like, orale. <laughs> now you're talking, you know? So it was all good after that. I mean, I watched over my shoulder a little bit, like, you know, hey, this fool might be tricking me or whatever, but, you know, it was cool. That was pretty much the end of it. I never seen dude again, so I don't know if he went back or what, but, um, you know. So anyway, um, that's pretty much the end of this story. I hope you guys, you know, are still there or still here. I hope you enjoyed it. And, you know, that's it for now. Your homie, Big Cisco. Peace.